fact, if a person changes his religion from Islam to any other religion, the punishment should be death. I was attacked from nowhere. I didn't see it coming. I knew I had to get out or that was it. What do you think your brother will do if they find out you're an atheist? Kill me, maybe. This is Nisa Hussein, a father of six. In November last year, he was going to his car when this happened. Two hooded men brutally beat him to the ground. He was left with broken bones and hospitalized. He says he was attacked because he left the faith of Islam and converted to Christianity. Since then, he says he's faced continual harassment from his local Muslim community in the north of England. In the months leading up to the attack, Mr. Hussein placed hidden cameras around his home, filming what he felt were threats against him and his family. Do you feel like it's been an active religious hate campaign to cleanse you out, essentially? Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt, actually, because as soon as my conversion seems to have spread like wildfire, and then before you know it, you're, sh you're shunned, isolated, and then treated with contempt. At the 2000 onwards, had three cars written off, almost daily abuse, intimidation, harassment, bricks thrown through the bay window, sworn at, spat at. My wife, especially with my daughters, being intimidated and harassed, and then things are escalated to such a degree that you literally are having to flee for your lives, actually. The, the attack was actually very sudden, and I just saw this thug just swing this pickaxe handle straight from my head, and I put my hand up to block it, actually, and my hand suffered fractures, and I reeled backwards and ended up falling, and then being concussed, being pummeled, and I suffered a fracture to my kneecap. We have lived with death threats and threats to our welfare and safety. I, I never really envisaged it would come in such a fashion just outside my front gate. Nissa Hussein is one of many Muslims choosing to leave Islam. Around the world, people who leave the Islamic faith can face state persecution and also violence at the hands of their local communities. So informal networks have come together linked by social media to help ex-Muslims who are in danger. Vice News has gained access to the London-based group Faith to Faithless. It started by me thinking that I was the only one in the world who had left Islam, because I didn't know you could do that. And um, quickly I realised, online at least, that that's not true. As I started meeting one person, 10 people, 20 people, I realised how many people there were, and then it kind of, it did snowball. It just went like, you know. So what kind of problems were you dealing with? emotional uh, abuse, people being kicked out by their families, uh, a lot of psychological trauma. As an example, this Ramadan that just finished, uh, I had to deal with five different attempts at suicide, and just, just in one month. But on the extreme side, it's things like kidnapping, forced marriage, risk from their family or the wider community. Although Faith to Faithless is very private, Sara is one person prepared to speak openly. She says she lost her faith around the age of 12 and things came to a head two years ago. So when I was 17, um, I had a boyfriend, my first boyfriend. Um, and unfortunately, my parents found out um, quite early on into the relationship as well. Um, and basically my parents threatened me with they're going to pull me out of college, they're going to marry me off. It felt like lockdown and I knew I had to either get out or that was it. So I didn't really have anywhere to go. They'd already taken away anything I could use to contact anyone else. But luckily, uh, while I was actually um, looking for a way to uh, kill myself, actually, I found uh, my old phone, which had some old numbers in. I left, I literally ran out of the house through fields as far as I could. Now I talk to my family and I kind of feel like we don't need each other anymore. 
and we're never going to be quite right again. So that's quite difficult. But um, yeah, I have had quite a few suicide attempts since. Unfortunately. Since leaving your parents' house? Since leaving, yeah. When you were back then, you were 17? Yeah. It's mainly loneliness. Um, feeling lonely, feeling like no one wants you, no one needs you. As serious as the situation can be in the UK, for ex-Muslims living abroad, the repercussions can be even worse. A comprehensive report released by a humanist organization stated that in 13 countries across the world, all of the Muslim states, apostasy carries the death penalty. And in other countries like Bangladesh and Tunisia, people who have left the faith are often attacked by extremists. Imtiaz shows me messages from one case he handles, a young Syrian atheist called Rana. She says she comes from a very religious family who live in Saudi Arabia. I think I first spoke to her actually about a year ago. She was having some troubles and she wanted to get out. After her family made her attend the Grand Mosque in Mecca, she secretly took this photo and sent it to a Facebook site for atheists where it was posted. When she right. first did that, okay. when she was still in Saudi, that went completely viral. She's now on the run and has escaped as far as Turkey. Imtiaz's network is helping her as she's desperate. Hello? Hi. Hi. Rana. I'm Poppy. Hi, Poppy. How are you? Fine, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. You took a photo that said Atheist Republic. Yes, Atheist Republic, it's a website and uh, Facebook and Twitter for non-believer people, uh, for uh, ex-Muslim, ex-Christian, ex-Jewish, uh, any kind of religion. The Kaaba, the most yes. holiest place, was in the shot. Yes, two, two million or three million uh, Muslims <laughs> around me. I was really afraid, you know, if any someone know what I am doing here, they will uh, kill me in, in there. Why did you decide that, t that morning or that day? What uh, made you post that photo? First message I want to say, I am not Muslim and I am not a believer, but I am here. I don't have a choice to come here. I can't tell my mother I am not Muslim. And I can't tell my father, uh, my family, I am not Muslim. And my brother is very strict. And uh, one day when he think I have a boyfriend in Saudi Arabia, he put uh, like a machine in my room to make a recording. So he put a secret tape in your machine? Yes. He come to my room and start to, to want to kill me. You have boyfriend, you know, it's haram, you want to, you know, this. Uh... So he tried to, he, he hit you, he beat you up? Yes, yes. After my brother tried to kill me and he hit me, I tried to kill myself and I, I, had, I have this car here in my hand. What's the last thing that your dad or your brother said to you? They said, we will come to you, we will find you. So Rana, you're in Turkey now, what are your plans next? I want to go to country to protect me and to be safe in this country and my family can't go for this country. Thank you so much for talking to us. Imtiaz's group and the Atheist Republic in America set up a crowdfunding site for Rana and raised $5,000 to help support her. In August, we flew out with Imtiaz to meet her. So Imtiaz and I are on our way to meet Rana for the very first time to see what Imtiaz can do to try and help her. We've asked her to meet us in Izmir, one of the largest port towns off the coast of the Mediterranean. Izmir is very close to the Greek borders, so very close to Europe. But actually Rana is still in danger. Bye-bye. You look so different. So nice to finally meet you. <laughs> she's changed her appearance because she's nervous the local Syrian population may find out who she is. This is Rana's flat. It's through the crowdfunding that she's been able to pay rent on this place. Um, but she doesn't have long. I uh, have three weeks also. Three weeks left, yeah. So Rana, can you show me around? <laughs> yeah, I see here my stuff. Rana, all this stuff here, yeah. you packed with you from Saudi? Uh, no, stuff? only my abaya and uh, t-shirt. What's the plan? Uh, if I get any visa, I can go to Europe. She says her family knows she's in Turkey, but they don't know that she ran away because of her atheism. What do you think your parents will, will do, like your dad or your brother will do, if they find out you're an atheist? Kill me, maybe. 
Are you being serious? Yes. Over lunch, Rana shows me a video she recorded of her first day in Turkey. I was walking in the street and I see some people play music. And you were saying you wanted to dance in the streets. What did you say? Your dream was yeah. I dream of Saudi Arabia to dance in the street. <laughs> what are the dangers of living here? What are you really worried about? Uh, my family know I am here. If they know I am here, it's very dangerous because I think my brother will be come here. If he didn't kill me, he will back me to Saudi Arabia. And you've got the Syrian community here, so it's also very dangerous for you yes, because... Yes, I will not speak with any Syrian people here. Uh, and I change my look to don't look like, uh, like a Syrian girl or Arab girl. Imtiaz is trying to find a refugee charity that can help Rana in Turkey. But she's thinking of having herself smuggled illegally into Europe, despite the dangers. So we spoke to some people who work in this area. The problem with illegal is that because you're going through the ocean sometimes or through the truck, a lot of people die. I, you know that, I'm sure. But also you're a woman, and there's a very, very different danger for women. You know, I understand if you don't have a choice, you don't have a choice. If I don't have a choice, I will do it. I understand. When I was in Saudi Arabia, I dreamed to walk alone in the street like a normal people, uh, like all girls dream about that in Saudi Arabia. Uh, walk alone without cover, without hijab, without, without niqab. Can you tell me why you're doing this? Why is it so important to you? I only want to live like a normal people, without afraid someone, maybe you know, you are a theist and kill you. Without afraid, your family, it's no, you are not a believer. Is there anything that you miss about Saudi Arabia? Uh, my family. Uh, I know they are now worried about me and some uh, my big brother want to kill me, but uh, I miss my time with my family. I miss my uh, family, uh, mother food. And I hope one day I can meet them. But not now. But not now, yes. When I come here the first day, I only walk, uh, stand up in the street and take a breath. <laughs> Finally! <laughs> I did it! Finally! <laughs> Another one! <laughs> Hi Rana, can you hear me? Hi, I'm Diaz. Hi. You sound, you sound exhausted. It's October now and Rana Skypes Imtiaz. She says she's getting desperate and has decided to be smuggled into Europe. Have you spoken to anyone about other routes out of Turkey? No, it's not. And you guys trust the people who are going to take you? No, or yes, or maybe? Yes, yes, we, we know the people we want to go. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Her heading down to Germany, there's a lot of risk there, but at the same time, there's also risk of things like self-harm. She's been feeling very um, suicidal and um, you can understand because she doesn't have a job, she's running out of money, she's got a month left on rent. A couple of weeks later, Rana starts sending us videos she takes on her phone. Tomorrow or after tomorrow I will go to Europe. Uh, I feel afraid and worried. Uh, it's dangerous trip, but uh, I don't have choice. I am waiting to leave to Kia now, but the weather will not help us. It's raining and it's bad. Uh, the sea is dangerous now. Uh, maybe our trip tomorrow, not today. Uh, I leave my house yesterday and I give the owner the key. I don't have house now. Uh, we are waiting now someone who will take us to the boat. I am afraid, nervous, worried. Uh, I don't know what will happen. The smugglers take her to a beach on the coast of Turkey. We are now at the point where we can go to Jersey. Uh, I hope to arrive uh, safely. But that's all we hear from Rana for a while. After a few days, she makes contact again. So the last we heard from Rana was two days ago. I've just got messages come through on Facebook. She said that she was at the beach and four boats had set off for Greece and she was supposed to be on the fifth boat. And apparently the moment she was supposed to get on that boat, the police came. Jinder Mahir, we are skipped for them. They search about 
refresh. So it looks like she's going to be in Turkey for a while longer. In November, we get more videos from Rana. She's trying to cross into Europe once again. We will leave today at uh, 12 o'clock. Uh, we will leave Izmir to go to a place where we can take the boat and go to Jersey. They're driven to a beach and left there alone. The place here is terrible, fucking place. No one here. It was very cold and now we light on the fire to warm us up. The smugglers turn up and Rana secretly films as she hands over the money. One or two hours we will go to Jersey. You can see the middle side. It's there. She's made it to a small Greek island first and then onto a boat to Athens. We are so happy. We are free to do what we want and how to do it. Over the next two months, Rana continues to send us updates. She travels through Macedonia, Serbia, Slovakia, Croatia, Austria, and finally into Germany. I am so happy to be here. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> and I fly out to see her. So this is where Rana's ended up, in Cologne in Germany. It's New Year's Eve. She's in a refugee camp about an hour from here, and she's on her way to meet us now. Hi, Rana, it's Poppy. Can, can you hear me now? Hello? All right, I've seen you. Stay there, stay there. How are you? <laughs> You've made it. You left Saudi Arabia. Turkey. You left Turkey, Turkey. And now you're here. <laughs> what does it feel like? You're in this market, you're listening to this music. Dreaming, dreaming. You feel like, you feel your normal people. After everything that you've been through and everything that you've sacrificed, was it worth leaving yes, Saudi Arabia yes, yes. for this? I want to complete my study. Uh, I want to study nuclear physics or nuclear engineering. I know what's feeling when you live like a Muslim girl, but you are not. How many think about uh, they want to kill themselves? They want to die. Rana has now applied for asylum in Germany. But many more people around the world face persecution, like Raif Badawi and Ashraf Fayyad, in prison in Saudi Arabia, charged with apostasy. Meanwhile, Imtiaz says that since we started filming with him last year, he receives four more cases every week. And his group, Faith to Faithless, is about to start a tour of British universities where ex-Muslims will come out and share their stories.